So, Mom, I don't know if I've ever been as excited as I am today recording a podcast. <laughs> uh, I've had this idea for years, having you on the podcast. And I have wanted to ask you a lot of questions so that I can know the answers, but also so the listeners can know, because I, I talk about you a lot on the podcast. And then I asked people to submit questions, the listeners and the viewers on YouTube to submit questions. And the questions that they submitted were so good and so unthought of by maybe either of us that now I'm really excited to have this recording with you. And I know we're not going to get to all the questions, so I'm guessing we'll have to do this a number of times. <laughs> but welcome to the podcast, Mom Honda. Well, I'm really delighted that you even thought of me to interview because I feel on one hand very honored and on the other hand really surprised because I, I can't imagine that I would have anything to bring to your wonderful, deserving listeners. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's yet to be seen, Mom. Well, it all depends on how engaging and how interesting you are. Just joking. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, you, you have a long, interesting life. You're a smart person. You have a lot of wisdom. I talk about you a lot on the podcast, particularly in the videos, I think, about what I learned from you and what, oh, is, a, what is a part of my perspective or life or and certainly my emotional health uh, certainly only exists because of you and dad so you know there's a lot there and i you know i passively picked up on a lot of developmental things child development and parenting from you because of the daycare mm -hmm. i would watch you interact with the kids and of course, when I was 12, I wasn't taking notes or even caring <laughs> to, to, to take notice of it, but I was so in the midst of it because it was in our house yeah. that I just noticed a lot of things. You know, you just pick up on things. And when I'm talking on the podcast, I will often tie things from adult behavior to child experiences and different things that go right or wrong. And I'm often thinking, well, that kind of reminds me of what my mom would do in terms of how to help kids through emotional experiences, which is arguably 90% of what a daycare involves, right? So I, I hope we can get into it. So let's get into some of these questions, mom. I, I started with some of the easier ones, just to kind of start light, if you will. We go easy and slow. Yeah. <laughs> so patron Takara, he says, do you still make spaghetti on Gohan? <laughs> Of course, that's the only way to be eating. You still it. do? Oh yes. That's funny. So oh, for those, yes. those who don't, gohan is rice and Japanese sticky rice to be specific. And uh, I talk about how we would have a giant plate wall to wall with no <laughs> yes. no plate exposed. Right. With a bed of thick gohan, right, mm -hmm. and then a massive pile. <laughs> of spaghetti and sauce. Were there meatballs? I feel like there weren't meatballs. No, I often would use uh, just ground beef for ground turkey. Or... In the sauce? Yes. Yeah. The reason for doing that is because our family was large, and yeah. in order to make your food go further, you fill up with the carbs. And so you could do that, and it didn't matter whether it was spaghetti or stew or whatever. Beef stroganoff? Yeah, everything. Yeah. Went on huh. that bed of... So of was that the primary rice. reason was it was it trying to... Increase the out The caloric put. count. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> from, tummy. It would... Yeah. I have a funny story about oh. the tummy because we when were involved with your school sports of the different kids, you know, and it often disrupted the dinner hour. And so I hurriedly made this dish of fractured tacos that the family loved. And so you made your tomato sauce, etc., and then you put in to that sauce cooked rice. Well, one night I was in a hurry, and so I didn't quite wait till the end of the rice cooking time. It was nearly done. 
So the whole family, we all sat around. We ate. We gobbled. We got off to the sported. And it um, expanded in our stomachs. It did, and it made us all miserable. <laughs> <laughs> Each and every one of us. Uh, so it did too too well of a job. Yes. That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Well, uh, interesting. I, I mean, it's also a Japanese American thing, right? You have. Did you learn that as a from Japanese American cuisine to have well, things I don't on top know. of going? I. I I'm quite sure that Grandma Honda did influence me in that regard because... I mean, I just figured that's a direct recipe. They yes, they ate it that way too. And so yes. when you married dad when you were 19, uh, dad wanted it that way. And you were like, okay, let's just... Uh, I have a customer of one in the kitchen. Yeah. So that's what he wants and that's what we'll make. And then as each kid was introduced to the family. I, I was pretty old before I knew that... Uh, norm, normal people <laughs> didn't have spaghetti with Gohan uh, or that literally, uh, you know, the big joke in our family was that we would go to our white friends' homes for dinner and we would report back and say, you can see plate in between the different food items. You have your pork chop and your corn and your potatoes, and there's actually clean plate in between the three different elements of the meal. It, growing up for us, it was always just a lot of food and a lot of it and wall to wall, you know, and giant glasses of whole milk. And it, yeah, we just, we ate a lot growing up. Well, it was really important to dad and I that we provided good meals. Uh. And for a long time, we, you wouldn't buy lunch, you would take your lunch. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure I've told you this at some point. Uh, so the most common thing for kids in school was that their parents would send them to school with money to buy a school lunch. It's just so much easier, right, to send a, I think it was like a $1.20 or something. But you almost never did that. Even among people that had homemade lunches, the lunch that you made was always like way beyond what other people would make. Most people would have like a, a real smushed, PB and J with <laughs> with an apple that had our that had also smushed it in the bag and maybe a carrot or something and you would have two giant sandwiches with like turkey and and mayo and cheese and lettuce and not not just one but two and then a giant Ziploc bag full of Doritos or Cheetos or something and then a Capri Sun back when that was not a thing I mean I remember I would come to school and in the fifth grade, my friends like Chris White, you remember Chris White, he every day would ask if he could buy one of my, <laughs> one of my sandwiches. That's funny. <laughs> and so uh, occasionally I would make like 50 cents or a dollar from selling your, uh, your food on the black market, mom. And you didn't share this with me. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> we could have had a business going. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's funny. We could have. Uh, but uh, it was, at the time, I didn't appreciate it, I guess. But looking back, I think like how interesting that is that when I'm sitting there eating my lunch, probably somewhat thinking, well, my mom puts a lot of effort into me, you know, into our food and to, and all the other kids, you know, I'm guessing their parents love them, but maybe not as much as my mom loves me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, surely that was it. Well, and also when you are in the kitchen cooking, I've read this to be true. I don't know if it's true, but when you are the cook, you are instilling love into that dish or that offering of food. So that is a wonderful thing to be taking in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I didn't realize this also growing up, just how much that idea is infused in our lives. Other families don't, don't necessarily think that way. They communicate love maybe in a different way, and that's fine. But what is communicated through food, not only the making of it, the, the preparation of it, the amount of it, but the eating of it as well, the appreciation of it. I, I find myself when I'll, I'll go to someone's house and I'm not the, you know, like if I'm going to one of Stacy's relatives' house or something and they have extra food that they're offering for people to take home with them afterwards. And I always have this huge instinct to 
be appreciated to show appreciation and, and actually uh, not only because it's it's good food and it's it's useful to me but it's a gesture that i mm-hmm. appreciate what they are giving it's not impolite it's not greedy no when, it is not you know when you are a a host, one of the best things that someone can do as they're walking out the door is, is take uh, food with them, you know, that, that, that you have extra because you're not going to eat all of it. And well, it's such a compliment to whoever had contributed to that right. meal to be able to say, oh, they wanted it, they liked it enough to take it home. Right. I mean, not only did they power through the food at the, <laughs> at the event, but they liked it so much that they actually want to have it a second time at home. Mm-hmm. And I find that most people don't have that instinct. They they don't think like that, you know mm. what I mean? Or at least anecdotally. Along those lines, mom, patron, Lise from Belgium, they ask, what is your favorite Japanese food? My favorite Japanese food would have to be rice. Wow. It is so adaptable. A particular kind of rice? Oh, oh yes, the sticky Japanese rice. Yeah. <clears throat> what I learned to say gohan and in our family it was always gohan but that rice you can make sandwiches out of it i mean actually they they call them onigiri and you can put things inside that are yummy like tuna fish or uh, salted plum you can wrap seaweed and rice go really well together actually rice and anything goes together Mm -hmm. um if you're sick Putting uh, hot green tea poured over rice mm. will uh, just, you know, it's a bland sort of comfort food. Uh, if you can't take anything else, maybe you can take that. And you can put it into soups, and it's just so adaptable. Mm. I love it. Well, it's comforting that that's your favorite food because you were not forced, but <laughs> you were thrown into the Japanese American experience, including the food, when y- you married dad. And the rice gohan culture is, is very strong in the Japanese. I mean, uh, full disclosure, there will be times like at Thanksgiving, for example. Thanks- Japanese American Thanksgiving has all the regular turkey and the cranberries and the stuffing, but we have uh, like this whole second section of the food experience, which is all the Japanese American comfort food items. Like, gohan and whatnot and at thanksgiving sometimes i don't have gohan and dad will say well you forgot to get gohan and i'm like yeah i think i'm gonna pass because it's it's kind of filling and i'm trying to eat like other uh, more kind of important things (laughs) and dad will just be aghast you know it's it's sacrilegious it's it's like a well what doesn't go with gohan you just need Go yeah. on to go with something, your gravy or your cranberry sauce or your turkey. Yeah, but, you know, there's a reason why at a buffet <laughs> they have bread because mm-hmm. it's cheap and it fills you up, and so you don't eat the the more expensive things that people want, you know. A buffet-style Thanksgiving, I, I have a similar kind of principle that I follow. of just, well, don't, because you're going to eat a lot, and you're going to want to eat a lot of different things, so don't fill up. But I'm. it's comforting to know, because I, I could have seen that going either way. I could have seen for you saying, like, I don't want to have Gohan again for the rest of my life because of just how much I've had to deal with it. Like every day, literally every day from I'm guessing 1963 mm, until definitely. until Kevin was old enough maybe to eat on his own. But even beyond that, you probably... Oh, we still do. We have it every day. Every day. Every day. Still. But let me tell you this. When I was growing up, my mom wasn't the greatest of cooks. She managed, and I came from a family of five children. But I loved mashed potatoes. Absolutely adored them. I would eat as much as I could, and she rarely would fix it. I could go down the hallway and look into the dining room, and there would be our meal. So I could get kind of excited going down the hallway. But when I saw like a, an ice cream scoop, I thought, oh my, of white something on my plate. I thought we were going to have mashed potatoes. I was just excited. And then I'd get to my plate and it would be rice. And so rice was a big disappointment to me growing up. Mm. Why did my mother choose rice 
over mashed potatoes. I never figured it out. But once I did, as an adult asked her, and she said that in my dad had to work a lot of construction, go from boarding house to boarding house or, or small town to small town, and they always had mashed potatoes. So he really did not care for them. That's why they were never on our plate. Huh. And I I thought, well, now that makes sense. But, yeah. Because I craved them and he couldn't stand them. <laughs> yeah. Huh. And they were probably bad mashed potatoes. Could be. I don't know. But just yeah. too much of a good thing. I don't think I knew that level of detail about your dad that when they were young, he, in 20s, 30s. And or even before, um, as a teenager. Oh, okay. He traveled. Uh, he was started at the bottom with construction. One of the most significant conversations I ever had with him or in my life was when he told me about, uh, so I graduated with my bachelor's degree and I, w- I was having a hard time getting my career going. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had a business degree and I just had this impression that they just handed you a career and they didn't, you know? <laughs> and so I was suddenly faced with the reality of networking and applying and getting experience of which I had none of. And so I, I just, I couldn't find a job. And uh, the only jobs I could uh, seemingly qualify for were really jobs for high schoolers before graduation. Like I got a job at a foot locker, you know, at a, at a shoe, I got a job as a shoe salesman for like minimum wage. And I was talking to granddad about it on the phone and I was upset about it. And he said, well, when I started out, I started out as a cement mixer. And what he was indicating was, he started out at, at the lowest level on the construction site. Then he worked his way up to, uh, you know, swinging a hammer, and then eventually he's a foreman, and then eventually he's an architect, and then eventually he's a contractor. Eventually he's a construction magnate in Spokane, a, a well-known construction figure to the point where he was man of the year in Spokane. <laughs> and he worked his way up, and cause I only knew him in my life as this very successful person. And I would have thought that he he got a career right out of graduating with his BA. And he said, no, you know, I started as a spin mixer. And so it instantly changed my perspective to, okay, everyone starts at the bottom and that's just how it goes. And so it completely switched my perspective and how I saw where I was in life, you know? And uh, uh, started at the bottom, you know? And then eventually I switched careers and became a therapist, but... But I didn't know that. So when he was doing that kind of work, it was very itinerant, if you will. And mm-hmm. he's traveling around the, the Kansas area, probably in neighboring states, right? Different jobs. And he's living in boarding houses. And he's uh, away from your mom, even though they're married. Is mm-hmm. that what I'm hearing? Yes. Often when he could, he would, and to the degree of involvement with a particular job, he would take his family so they did a lot of moving around right. as well. Yeah. But um, including moving to Spokane from Kansas for for you for cause right. for a job. He saw in from Kansas to Spokane that Spokane was an up and coming city. Well, not really. Oh. Uh, he, the company he was working for, Bus Boom and Raw, he uh, they sent him to the Northwest, and it was after World War II. <clears throat> they had the foresight to think that after the war there would be a lot of building. And so where would be a good place to have a branch? And so they thought Northwest. They sent my father and and his uh, young family to the Northwest to scope it out, I guess would be the word. You and your three older siblings. Mm -hmm. But back then, Spokane wasn't really much. It wasn't. It was the heart of the Inland Empire, as they call it. Well, they were trying to advertise themselves as such. And it wasn't until I am so dense or naive or something, but it was brought to my attention that we moved to Spokane in 1946, and then my dad's success really burst uh-huh. because in a matter of eight years, he now had this new home. Really fancy house. Yes. Uh, I just wish the listeners, I could just walk them through this house. It, to this day, it, you know, it's built in the 50s. 
But to this day, if you walked through this house today, you would say, whoa, this is beautiful. It's interesting. It's, it's nice. It's, there's different themes. The, and, then Textures your, and then your mom, you know, too. interior designed the, the rug and the, the, the vases and the art and the curtains and the wallpaper and the bathrooms. And <laughs> there was a literal Japanese garden in the middle of the house. Covered. Growing fresh, I mean, it's yeah. a fresh with, with living plants, garden with rocks and a waterfall that looked great down to a koi pond downstairs uh, and a beautiful wood with brass railings, uh, copper. Oh, copper! Wow, copper railing. Uh, a, a circular, uh, <laughs> a spiral, like grand staircase that you would see maybe in a really nice hotel in like Los Angeles or something. And then it was h- half in, half out. The garden was in the backyard. There were these, you know, floor to ceiling windows and Skylight. and uh, the backyard was was nice and vaulted ceilings and. It, it was just uh, an amazing, amazing house um, that you, you just don't see people doing. And uh, I loved it when you and dad came over just now and both of you said, this is kind of, you're, you've decorated, because it's been a while since you've been over, which I yes. hadn't realized. You said, this is kind of like grandma's house. And <laughs> that's just the best thing. Gerilyn, my cousin, your niece, is probably listening to this undoubtedly is listening to this she right will now. she will and uh, Hi, uh Geraldine. <laughs> we talk sometimes about how we're we're trying to re- recreate grandma's and and granddad's house you know it was a really just beautiful beautiful house and so yeah i always thought of granddad as this super rich uh very mm-hmm. successful guy but you saw him make that transition very very quickly and very significantly, right? Yes, and like I said, I wasn't aware of how quickly, you know, being in the midst of it and everything. But looking back, to be a struggling young family that came to Spokane and to do exploratory work and construction, you know, try to get your footing into a new town, and then boom, eight years' time makes such a change. He and mom were always interested in travel. And so that also blossomed out because the children were getting older. They had more free time and he was getting uh, more successful. So he had more free time probably too. Yeah. Yeah, I joke uh, that a lot of my family heirlooms from Japan... My my Japanese decor in my house, little items, 99% of them are from my white grandparents because they actually went to Japan because they could afford to do so, and they bought things because they could afford to do so. You know, my Japanese side was poor and couldn't go to Japan and couldn't buy things. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, a lot of the Japanese, I mean, aside from grandma's kimono, uh, with my Japanese grandma's kimono is right there. But um, there's a lot of things around this house where uh, they'll be like, oh, this is like from your Japanese heritage. I'll be like, well, yes and no. It's actually from my white grandparents. <laughs> um, but they eventually, I, I think kind of through dad, fell in love with Japan. And Oh, th- there's a story to that. Oh. Uh, yes, um, through dad or through our marriage, actually. So we got married in 1963, and at that time, Spokane was wanting to create the idea of a sister city. Yeah, because Seattle has Kobe. Yes. And Spokane wanted a sister sister city as well, yeah. And I don't know when the talks to do all of that uh, were happening, probably years and months ahead of our marriage, surely. But once we got married, those within the uh, white community leadership and the Japanese leadership, so the, the they context kind is, of came together. Well, the context this is you know pretty close after World War II. Yes, where particularly on the West Coast, the yes. Japanese enemy was feared and ferocious. You know the the, well, the, the war. Rep- repulsive you know i mean you didn't want to have anything to do yeah uh, to the point where they locked up uh, dad's family 
and relatives uh, in prisons, literally. They call them camps, but that conjures a much happier vision than what was the reality. And it's In fact, it's worse than prison because they didn't have insulation. They were in the middle of Wyoming, like the bitter winters of Wyoming with uh, plywood walls and no insulation. And They're trying to uh, really get away from the concentration camp concept and call them internment camps because they were being punished. They were being... Yeah. There were guard stations with machine guns, nests, pointing inward. They weren't... Inward, yeah, yes. They, they, and barbed wire fence. Well, before we get into this, Mama, I feel like I want to get back to some of these questions mm-hmm. because... I we, agree. We're going off topic, but I do want to get back because I know there are questions about uh, the interracial marriage that um, we, we'll get to in a second. So we're on question number three out of, I don't know, a hundred questions. Patron Tracy, she asks, does the constant slurping of your kids bother you? My husband is from Japan and he had to stop slurping because I couldn't stand it. So for context, I will occasionally talk about this or literally do it on the podcast where I'll be drinking coffee and I'll slurp. And I didn't realize that that wasn't normal until uh, I was with Stacy and she would be like, could you not slurp? Why are you slurping when you drink coffee? And I'm, I was like, huh? And I, I actually tried to physically drink coffee without slurping and it, it's like impossible. I can't, it feels like I'm just pouring liquid down my face and, you know, slurping, <laughs> it, it feels more controlled or something. I don't know. It, uh, so I must have gotten that from dad and and the the slurping of of uh, soup and kind of the shoveling of gohan into your face from the from the chawan bowl right so uh does that bother you i would have to say it never did i i wasn't aware of it until now oh really so, mhm i i am aware of good table manners <clears throat> i wanted that to be yeah you and dad were Sticklers for table manners. Mm -hmm. And if we were going to take you out to a restaurant, we wanted you to behave and and, um, know restaurant behavior, which home behavior should be the same. Yeah. So the slurping is interesting to me. I guess I don't recall Dad slurping his coffee. So for context, you're... In high school, you meet dad, and you have this secret relationship. And we'll get into this later, um, but um, for people to know. So you didn't see each other very often because you couldn't, because uh, your parents in particular were adamant that you not date dad, or that if you did, it would be very brief or something. When they became aware, they weren't adamant until they became aware that he could very well be in the picture. Meaning you might marry him or something mm-hmm. then then that's when your parents got really mm-hmm. upset and particularly your dad well and i i put this on them myself we're looking back i i felt there wouldn't be any acceptance if i were to bring dad home as a boyfriend yeah and so i thought that was explicitly told to you mm, i thought they set a rule that said you couldn't see it you, and you after s- okay here's the deal first of all we're interested in one another yeah <clears throat> In high school. In high school. I was a junior. He was a senior. And it began in April of the school year. But I was unsure. And uh, just to backtrack a little bit, he was dating your friend. Yes. And dad wasn't into her as much as she was into him or something? Well, she was a friend of mine. and Another white, um, another white girl. Right. Yeah. Adorable. She was so cute. She's a tiny little thing. and, and She's still with us? Yes, she lives in Bend, Oregon, and I still communicate with her. But she was adorable, just this little pixie of a thing. And so she would put her whole thing into her relationship. And so it was a brand new thing. She was dating uh, Alan, and and she was very excited about it. And it was going places. They were having a date here and there. Was it a topic of interest that dad was Japanese and she was white? No, not not particularly. Would it have surprised you if s- another friend came forward and said, like, what is your dad going to say or something? Oh, I, I could have dated naughty boys, you know, and then I would be unsure about bringing naughty boys, yeah. what I call naughty boys. 
I don't know. I'm who. trying to understand that the landscape. As I know there was a lot of racism, obviously, and a lot. Oh, of cons- there was for the city. There was. I don't know about the school. I was again post World War II. Right. <laughs> so. Right. Definitely in the city. Um, as far as my peers, I just associated with people who must have been more open-minded because I never in my within my friend group that just wasn't an issue it just what if you had dated a black guy it might have been questioned we just didn't have very many of uh, uh, even though it was an inner city school we didn't have very many black families yeah um, and there weren't that many japanese people either no yeah Mm-mm. and for those uh, following along at lewis and clark high school in, mm-hmm. in and it's inner city yeah dad was so think of the song Billy Joel Uptown Girl. Mom literally lived up a hill in the in the rich neighborhood on in near Comstock Park and dad literally lived downtown by the train tracks. When they decided to build I-90 straight through Spokane, they built it a half block away from dad's old house because typically when you're building a, a freeway through the middle of town and the government seizes land, they take it from the poor people. So th- this was literally like the, the dusty, mm-hmm. poor area, you know. I mean, it wasn't destitute, but... No, it was really a lovely area, primarily populated by the uh, Japanese. Mm. And they're very proud people and, and uh, took care of their properties. Also, uh, there were some black families who felt the same. They were uh, proud and yeah, black family lived and, right next to my, right mm-hmm. next to dad's house, and the, happy to take and, care of you know wanting to take good yeah. care of their property. Totally. So yeah. it was just but it modest, was, modest uh, living conditions, right? And it would be available land. <laughs> yeah. So the inner city high school issue was that the uptown girls would go down the hill and go to the inner city high school along with everyone else. Mm-hmm. So there's just more mixing. Okay, so then you start dating dad, and in your head, there's, and just for context, in, at, at this time in 1961 or whatever, when you're dating dad or 60, a couple states over in Wyoming, it's literally illegal for Japanese people to marry white people. It's against the law, it's on the books. Legislatures stood up and unanimously passed a law that said you could not get married. This is you know, not that far of a drive from Spokane. And uh, that's the context. So you have that sentiment around. And yet mom and her friends are like progressive, social justice-minded individuals that just don't care about such things. Well, people were people. It didn't matter what their color was. Right. But uh, I'm I'm quite sure that the majority of kids in your school uh, or a sizable percentage, and particularly their parents and families, uh, would not have been excited about their white kids dating anyone other than other white kids, right? Right, and that that would have been um, probably oozed in by osmosis into the children. Um, yeah. So the prospect of dating Dad, I I guess I wanted to know where is it going before I... Dad dad hit hit on you, right? Didn't he call you up or something? So he broke up with... Well, he didn't break up. He he ghosted her or something. Yeah. (laughs) Drifted. Yeah, he drifted. (laughs) (laughs) Passively switched from... uh, 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 But he met you or got to know you better through his girlfriend at the mm-hmm. time, <laughs> and then randomly calls you out of the blue, right? Yes. And uh, and you're like, oh, did you have a hot conversation with your friend or did you just let it slide? Well, I let it slide because I really didn't know, again, where is this going? Uh-huh. This is out of the blue. Why call me when I believed that he was having, when I say relationship, I'm calling it a relationship, but it's high school. I mean, remember that. It's just high school dating. And so there was something happening there that I wanted to recognize. So I just stayed mum on it Okay. <laughs> with my friend. And then she, he worked it out. I don't know. I do kind of think he did ghost her. <laughs> <laughs> Ghosting was a lot easier back then since yeah. it, there was it was harder to text someone. So then when you're with him, at what point do you start to realize, oh, there might be some pushback from my parents? Well, I don't know. I was too involved with the romantic side of our relationship that I and so it 
it continued. And really, it's it's slow motion when you're in high school or early, you know, college or something. We didn't have texting. We didn't have ways to stay in touch. Mm-hmm. And so... Uh, and not a lot of dating outside of school. No. So you, you saw each other at school in between classes. Right. Slow motion meaning that it would take a long time to deepen a relationship because you just didn't have a lot of time mm-hmm. together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, like I said, we started to date uh, in April. And then he graduates. What did you like about him? What did I like about him? <laughs> I liked his shoulders. <laughs> 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 it's kind of silly, but they were strong and broad, and and oh. um, I guess I hadn't really taken um, interest in a man's shoulders or, or a boy's physique. Or, and you didn't have a lot of dating experience prior to that. No, a- not as a at lot all. of girls didn't back then, right? No, uh, you did famously date Craig T. Nelson, the actor. Yes. But I, but I never dated him. He was in love with you in grade school up until like the seventh grade or something. I suppose, but we didn't date. Right, but he, you know. he had a crush on you. He wrote you a love letter at some point. He did, and he invited me to his birthday party. I gave him a dribble glass. Oh, a, a for, joke glass? Yeah, where if you yeah, yeah. drank, then did it would like dribble it? onto your shirt. D- did you like it? I don't know. <laughs> he just walked but away. But I was the only girl invited to his birthday party. Uh-huh. So for those who don't know, Craig T. Nelson, famously of the TV show Coach and a million other shows that he's been in. And when you have high school reunions, you and him catch up. So so when uh, you are starting to date dad, you are taking it slow. You're kind of inexperienced. You like his shoulders. What else did you like about him? <laughs> I liked uh, his voice, yeah. and uh, he was um, kind. He was gentle. He talked softly. He um, Was that nice? Because your dad is not a, a soft talker. No, no. Your dad is a loud, booming. You, you hear him from a mile away. Well, he enters the room, and you feel his presence. Yeah. Um, um, he just had this presence about him. But uh, Alan was just a kind person, and and oh, and he dressed fashionably. He, mm. I he was, <laughs> I don't know if people even pay attention, but he was clean. You know mm. what I mean? Yeah, he's always been a clean, <laughs> clean guy. Uh, I don't know another a more romantic way to say clean, but. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and for context, you and dad are the same height, so yes. it's not like he's a, this towering uh, <laughs> figure of masculinity over mom, uh, uh, you know, pretty similar weight and, and bone structure <laughs> and stuff. So, but at the same time, dad, uh, you know, when he was younger. He was an athlete. Yeah, he, he, he was a, a strong I just remember as a kid, I was just marveling at his forearms. He just seemed to have mm-hmm. like these giant forearms, you know. At what point did, and I know someone asked this, I don't, I can't see the question right now, but when did you know that dad was the one? And how did you know dad was the one? I think people are asking this question because they're thinking for themselves, how does one know? Because you've been with dad for 60 years, uh, married, uh, you've been with him for 63 years or something. So how did you know all the way back then that you would spend the rest of your life with him? I didn't. I get the feeling from time to time that there's a connection with one person or another. There, you just have a connection. It just feels good to be around that person. That person makes you feel important. That you're someone special. So I think, I think it was that that evolved through our letters because we didn't text. We wrote letters to one another. It developed that way. Uh, it wasn't. A boom moment. Although I did like the way, if we also in those days they had bench seats in the car, and so you could sit right up next to the driver, and he would put his arm around me. And there were no seatbelt laws back then. Yeah, so. no seatbelt laws. Put his arm around me, and then he would kiss 
the top of my head. Mm. And that just sent chills down here. <laughs> just silly things. So you're uh, uh, nestling up in his giant shoulders and <laughs> he kisses you on the top of the head and yeah. you just melt in his arms. Well, and then our first six dates... Our first six dates were to a drive-in movie. Oh, right. Uh, we've talked about this before. And we all know what high schoolers did at drive-in movies. We didn't watch the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one movie was Gone with the Wind. That's a long one. Yes. And the only thing I remember is uh, A Great Fire Jeez, the, the whole movie, Mom? <laughs> that's the whole movie, and that's all I remember. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's a lot of necking, as they used to call it, right? I mean, how did you have the stamina? Did you did you come up for air? Did you have, like, did someone hand you bottles of water so you could, like, hydrate during that? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a lot of intense uh, necking. That's a marathon. Wow. Uh, huh. Yeah. Uh, was that your first drive-in movie? experience. Mm -hmm. So dad was your first kind of foray into that world. And was was it the first time for dad? Oh, you'll have to ask him. I don't know. But I... My impression was he wasn't extremely experienced in that realm before. Probably not. I don't know. I thought he was the big man on campus because he was. Oh. He was athletic. So he was on the football team and he was... A cheerleader uh -huh. for the... <laughs> there was a, a male cheer squad. Yes. Yeah. And so he was a cheerleader his senior year. And they hadn't ever had a male cheer squad until that year. Mm. It was like six guys. Mm hmm And they would wear their Letterman's jackets, and they had the cones that they would yell out, I'm mm -hmm. guessing, right? Basketball games and stuff, right? But yeah, he played football and baseball and basketball. And he was... Uh, just known. He, he he may have been a um, school treasurer or something. I don't know. You know, they held an office, but he was just known. He was a popular guy. Huh. Okay. And incredibly handsome. Oh, okay. <laughs> so when did you know that you wanted to get married, the two of you? Well, I'll tell you what was a big deciding factor <clears throat> after a year, so um, he graduates, and then I finish my senior year. So um, it was at the end of my senior year that he, did we go together? I don't remember. I think Alan and I went together to mom and dad. I mean, I was, of course, living at home, and I told them that I wanted to date Alan. Openly. Openly, yeah. And that meant having him over to the house, maybe. Right. And, it be, well, and he could come to the door and pick me up before that. That wasn't possible. And and that clandestine behavior was why before that point? Well, that, that's, I've thought about it, and it wasn't because they said anything. I felt they would say something you just knew. in my immaturity oh they're not going to approve of this they're not going to like this one bit because he's japanese or because he's a guy because he's japanese and because he's a guy because i didn't date very many people yeah the the question of the whole a dating, serious relationship yes was not necessarily a an expectation that you would be doing that at that mm -hmm. at that age I, I don't know if i just have this as a made-up story or you told me but i thought that your parents had because you were the princess of the family not that you were necessarily spoiled but the well my siblings would say i, I it, was spoiled yeah so you have these three other siblings that are like 10 years older than you and they grew up during the tough times and then you come along and you're uh, born a nuisance in, well yeah a nuisance younger sister but also born into the family when you're doing well you had this, your own bedroom, and it was all pink, and, you know, they designed a room, a bedroom, just around you and around the ideal of a little white blonde girl, and you could argue bullied by your older siblings, right? And my impression was that as a part of the 
whole status thing, you know, because your parents grew up in modest conditions and had extremely mod, especially your dad grew up and was very poor, was very, 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 poor. very, very poor, like living in a shack kind of a thing with probably just like a, a fireplace to keep you warm at night, that kind of thing. Large family. Yeah. And his mom was what we probably imagine to be depressed, maybe bipolar, in and out of institutions. Uh, she would sit and stare. Okay. And his dad, your dad's dad, was a construction worker who lost his leg in an accident because it, it went gangrene because he had an injury. And and he didn't take over the mothering of the children. He basically just kind of made the kids into orphans. They went to an orphanage well, for a while. he took the older ones to work with him because that, they were boys, and the older boys could at least do some help. And they're seven years old and stuff. You know? Yeah. And so uh, there was a lot of poverty, a lot of neglect, and then I'm just guessing that as they were suddenly thrown into riches and in a new town where they could reinvent their, it was sort of like Great Gatsby kind of stuff where- Who, my father? Yeah, and, yes. and mom, where they could mm -hmm. suddenly now have this beautiful, you know, possibly one of, if not the best home in, in Spokane, because <laughs> it was designed by him with all the modern accoutrement, you know, modern appliances, stuff, appliances that people would be wowed at today. Their fridge was amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I want their fridge. It was a mm -hmm. built-in fridge. Stainless steel. Yeah, I mean, it, the, there was so many just, that there was a barbecue that was both inside and outside and a, this big brick hearth kind of thing. And it was just amazing. And uh, they have all the nice clothes and they can travel and they have uh, this bar downstairs where they could entertain and they have uh, entertain you know they have parties and stuff and so you, uh, you are the the bell of the ball kind of a thing where they're gonna uh, parade you around kind of you know that's like look at Susan who is this beautiful mm. uh, you know up and coming uh, uh, our daughter our special daughter right and so she is going to go to college at West at Washington State, you know, Cougars, which was also loved by y your family because you know Spokane's near uh, Washington State University. And my impression was they were, you were going to go to sorority and you're going to me meet a good white frat guy, fraternity guy, who was upper crust, and you were going to live the dream, the white American post-war dream, and that was going to be an additional. You know, I don't want to say status symbol for your parents, but something along those lines, or that was the that was the the ideal that was fed to them, maybe by society or something. And then you come home and tell them that you're dating a Japanese guy from the inner city of Spokane. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did they react? Well, not very happily, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> and they said, "Okay, we will give you." three dates and uh, to call it off. So is this their way of uh, accommodating or? Yes, like they were meeting me halfway. <laughs> right, because they could have said no and yeah, never. Never see each other again. But they're like, well, we don't want you to be a mean person. So, you know, let him down easy. <laughs> well, and and so uh, we did. We we. Took Loved. advantage. We took advantage of those three days. Because he could actually come to the door. Yes, yeah. and we could feel like a, a couple, and it felt really fun. And then after the three dates, then we went back to secretly dating. <laughs> yeah. So. And you would tell your parents that you were going to a friend's house or something. Well, by that time, I was at the sorority. Oh. So there wasn't much. Uh, they didn't ask about Alan because they believed I obeyed them. <laughs> so you go off to Wazoo to Washington State and you're in a sorority. You're in Pi Fi's? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you are dating dad from afar. He doesn't live in Pullman. He's, no. he's about an hour or two living in Spokane mm -hmm. still, uh, maybe going to Eastern, Uni Eastern Washington University at that point. And you're secretly dating. Uh, perhaps some more drive-in movie well, we're theaters. Well, se secretly having a, a relationship because we're in different cities and writing letters and so forth. So yeah. I we'll think see. I have one of those letters, actually. 
I have a good number of them. Uh, sadly, when my mom did find out that I was dating Alan during my college year, it was in the spring, and she told me, asked me, did I write, did we write letters? Because at the time, calling long distance was really expensive, mm -hmm. so it, obviously it would be a letter writing situation. And um, I said yes, and so she had me show them the letters to her, and she says, we're taking all those letters and we're going to burn them. Mm. So we went down, took them, put them in the trash barrel. How were you feeling at the time? Hmm? How were you feeling at the time? Oh, I was terribly distraught. I still am to this day. Yeah. Really uh, bothers me. But we put them in the trash barrel and burned them, stood there. And I'm guessing they had a long talk with you about it needs to end, right? They don't talk. They tell. And I was to obey. <laughs> I'm not very good at that, I guess. Mm -hmm. That must have been weird for them because you're not a rebellious person. You weren't as a teenager. No. So to learn that you had disobeyed for so long about something so fundamental must have been quite a shock to them. Well, I'm sure they didn't know what to make of it. I didn't know what to make of it myself. <laughs> yeah. But it wasn't going to influence my future with Alan. Yeah. You knew that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, w I was firm on that, that, uh -huh. that you can do anything you'd like. Yeah. Well, how did you find that inner strength? I don't really know. Um, I don't know where one re acquires those. Because you were basically a child. I know? was a child. Yeah. I don't even think of myself as being stubborn. I think I became stubborn. <laughs> but certainly I was stubborn with re regard to this. Why? It was important to me. And for context, I don't know if you want to get into it, but the... I'm just going to say it, abuse from your parents to you was severe. It, mm -hmm. it goes way beyond what we're saying in this moment because of all this. You know, it wasn't just like this one moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it got physical and severe. And so there was a lot. And, and of course, just your parents' disapproval of you, right? Mm -hmm. and, and maybe your whole community. I don't know. That was your whole life was your family, right? And and to have that, have them turn on you in that way. Um was a big deal, uh, you would just imagine that a kid, a child, would have second thoughts, but you didn't. No, and and why? You know, like, how did you find that? I don't know. I remember my uncle, maybe they was visiting, maybe they asked him because he was a favorite uncle of mine at the time. Which uncle? Uncle D Dale. Uncle Dale. He talked to me and he said, you know, you want to think of the future. You want to where where is this going to lead? And and he was talking nicely and and everything. And I just turned off listening. And when he was done talking, I got up and went to my bedroom. I, <laughs> I mean, it, it had absolutely no impact on me. Huh. Do you think your parents very? hands-off approach to parenting played a role because they weren't they did have a hands-off right and the what what often will happen is that the kids will learn to be very independent to the point where if the parents suddenly do side decide to get involved the kid has a pretty solid idea of who they are and their own decisions and feel they've been left to their own devices i mean famously you are three years old and wandering the neighborhood. And yes, some of the best years were when I lived in that first house. I knew that neighborhood. Yeah. You I, would walk up to the kindergarten class because you longed to be with other kids and, and to be in kindergarten, and you would creepily peer in through the window watching the kindergarten class. I climbed on the outside, the exterior yeah. wall. You had to kind of scale yes, over. Yes, 
uh, on on bricks that were mm-hmm. kind of sticking out, and you're, you're looking in through this window about five <laughs> feet ab- above the ground. And the teacher and kids would occasionally, oh, there's that oh, little yeah. that little curly blonde girl is looking at us again. <laughs> And it was disruptive to the classroom. <laughs> right, but uh, uh, very much left to your own devices. And so do you think that might have played a role? Well, I looking back, and maybe you could analyze it better, but yes, the, it, they didn't guide me. They didn't particularly s- support me. They led me different directions as a youngster to uh, golf and acrobatics and uh, diction and you know, opportunities, I guess, to... But there weren't long, deep conversations with no. you about how you felt or where you were oh, going. Oh, we never talked. There was never any conversations at all. Uh, and I think I passed that on to you guys because I don't think that I was very good at guiding and suggesting resources or what you could do about this or that because I didn't know. I, I didn't have answers. Mm -hmm. So I think you're right. When they did take a stand and say, this is what we require of you, it didn't sit well with me. You're now becoming involved. (laughs) Yeah, right. All of a sudden now you're interested in my decisions Mm -hmm. and my life. Like you weren't prior. I gave up a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I wanted you to be involved more emotionally when I was young, but I'm over it now. So Mm -hmm. I have... I'm not really interested in your opinion. You're just another person telling me an opinion. Great. Thanks for sharing. But Mm -hmm. I've, I've been living my own life for a long time. I really was independent. I loved it. I thought life was good. I, I had a a place where I could go to get a cookie if I knocked on the door and I had in the neighborhood. mm -hmm, And I knew all the bushes to hide under if I wanted to spy or which trees were good for climbing. And so to kind of conclude this chapter, you end up at that point. So it's in the spring of your freshman year in college and your parents find out and proceed to, abuse you and put their foot down but soon at this point i can cut this out (laughs) but you get pregnant (laughs) yes with mark with my with uh, Mm -hmm. my older brother mark and you are again freshman in college you would have been just 19 at that point dad would have been 19 as well turning 20 soon so you get pregnant i'm guessing for you and dad you think well at some point we'll get married but we're kind of young and we're working on our schooling right now and so let's well let's get our our life a little bit more established yeah and um beyond half a year of college right so you get pregnant then what so then uh um we had decisions to make and uh happily dad stepped right up beautifully i mean he just really wasn't upset about it at all he was really quite excited yeah my you've said before that you and dad would have conversations prior about how many kids you wanted and you always both wanted big families i think you both come from a family of five kids Mm -hmm. and uh, i think both of you uh, on some early date revealed to each other that you both wanted to have five kids i wanted 12 (laughs) oh and dad wanted five or something yeah okay and it was a conversation. You're both are very family oriented. You come from big families and wanted to. You were oriented that way very early with with. Well, each other. I had a real special relationship with my younger brother. Yeah. And he was my family. He's the family that I relate to yeah. when I say family. Right. Right. And you wanted to create that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Huh. That is. I don't know if I ever thought about that because you know my conceptualization of your family is a lot more elaborate than I've talked about already, but you know, I've already touched on some of those themes and the distance and the, the abuse and the bullying and the, you know, the distance. But, but you're not a distant person, really. You, you're a warm, family-oriented, inviting, complimentary. Needy. <laughs> well. I, I loved my little brother because he loved me back. Well, that was brand new. Well, I, I don't know if I've ever thought about it, but... That relationship was perhaps the only close relationship that you 
had ever experienced prior mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. having your family of your own. And that warmth and that mutual dependence and that kindness and attachment without that with your younger brother, you might have been completely lost in the woods once you started your own family. I wonder. I don't know. Because you didn't have that with your parents and you didn't have that with your Mm -hmm. older siblings. So without that with your younger brother, where would you have been? It would be interesting to contemplate. But he he wasn't... He was seven years younger, you know, so he uh, he wasn't close in age. But I was uh, responsible for him in a lot of ways, Uh, would babysit him or, but be put in charge of his care and well-being while he was growing up. And and I loved him like a mom. It's interesting because the inner resources that you had, even at that phase of life, is notable because it would have been very tempting for you to bully him in the way you were being bullied Mm. and to be distant from him in the way you're being distanced from this child. Because that's often what happens is, you know, kids do what they see. And so interesting. Or he could have been my nuisance, like I was a nuisance to my older siblings. Right. He could have been a nuisance, but he wasn't. (laughs) But there's a choice that you made, a perspective, something. So you get pregnant and you decide to elope, correct? Mm-hmm. Uh, did dad propose to you? I forget. Or did you just decide as a team? I think it was a team effort. <laughs> <laughs> but dad gave you a ring. Oh, that came prior to the pregnancy. Oh, mm-hmm. like a promise ring? Mm-hmm. Like a pseudo-engagement ring? Mm-hmm. Do you still have that ring? No, sadly. What happened I, to it? It fell off my finger. Oh. Um, just recently in my life recently it was um about three years ago really so you wore that ring that was the ring that you wore mm-hmm. that was the wedding ring you're gonna make me cry because i it, i'm just devastated that that fell off my finger it was it was that gold was, band mm-hmm. huh that was the same ring yeah i didn't know i didn't know that that was the ring wow mm-hmm. that's amazing and you lost it where grocery shopping at um High-end grocery. Uh, what, Whole Foods or Metro Markets? Or, yeah, Metropolitan Market. And uh, you figure it must have fallen off in the store? Yeah, store or parking lot. Parking lot, lot yeah. And someone and, just took it and didn't turn well, it Well, they didn't turn it in. It wasn't turned in. It, it could be very unnoticeable. How long? So a few years ago. Only two or three years ago. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, that or sucks. Or before we moved here. But. Yeah. I <laughs> I would love to have that ring. Yeah, that's too bad. So then you decide as a team, well, we always knew we were going to get married. Mm-hmm. This just rushes things a little bit. Mm-hmm. And maybe someday I'll take a class on birth control. But <laughs> that ship has sailed. So uh, <laughs> lesson learned. And uh, uh. one too many... Drive in movies. <laughs> <laughs> and so then uh, you decide to get married, but you know you can't do it out in the open because that's not going to work. Well, and, my, and, and my parents had made their stand that they didn't go for this. Yeah. So I made my stand that right. I was going to proceed. Right. Side note dad's community and family were more accepting of an interracial marriage, but not necessarily enthusiastic they were not enthusiastic at all no uh what would be the benefit i mean you know you're just going to cause troubles yeah for you and your kids and, yes and it, your dad went to their house and banged on the door and mm-hmm. told uh, dad's parents to keep their son away from you that kind mm-hmm. of thing and uh yeah and, and it was rare back then especially in spokane it was a little more prevalent in seattle or Los Angeles or something, but but pretty rare across the United States. Mm-hmm. Not only interracial marriage, but particularly between Japanese and, and white people. So you decide to elope, and you elope to Idaho. There's a little shack that was for weddings. No, it was a cute little uh, home that was probably built in the 30s or something. A cottage-type home. Yeah, little, little house. Clappered, and it had a big picture window. <laughs> yeah. remember that? And it was your last day of college, mm-hmm. so you had everything packed up, and 
you're leaving Pullman and you're going straight. Dad comes, picks you up. You go straight to Idaho. You have it all planned out. Uh, coincidentally, they're open because we found out later that there was a good chance they would have been closed. They weren't. They weren't open. Oh. We had to knock on the window, and then there was. We noticed this note saying they were closed, but you could call this number. Well, again, no cell phone, and we didn't have a marriage license either. And the um, this little house was across the street from the courthouse. So we ran over to the courthouse, which was about to close. <laughs> we didn't look into anything. And we got our license, and they said, you're going to have to call for them to come and see if, see if they will come. Mm -hmm. And so that was what we did. We mm -hmm. made a phone call. I, and you had a friend. Uh, dad dad yes. had a friend, Bob, mm -hmm. uh, another Japanese-American guy. And... He was a witness because you need and you need a second witness. So it was like the phlebotomist or something. Wasn't oh it? yes, my maid of honor was the phlebotomist. Right, because you also didn't know that you needed to have witnesses right? or even blood work. Yeah, I mean, you had blood work. Yeah, they had to test for the Rh factor. Okay, some kind of recessive gene that they mm -hmm. had some regulation around. And you get married, and you are given a gift certificate for a cake. Correct? Yes. And then you walk down the street and get your cake yeah. and have a, have a <laughs> slice of cake. And then now's the business for getting back home. Were you showing by that point? Oh, goodness, no. Okay. Mm -mm. It would have just been a few months. Yeah. So then you go back home and you're married, so you're living together. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're thinking, well, once we're married, my parents, I know them. They'll have to adjust. They're not going to tell you to get divorced, right? Well, I don't know that they would tell me, I, but as far as adjusting, that was a, dis a decision that they would have to make. I'd made my decision. Okay. And now it was up to them what they were. Going so you, to. you didn't know if they would just oh, they disown could you disown forever? Me. Yes. You thought that was a Very, possibility? Oh, yes, definitely. And then you go to the Japanese American church and hide out in the basement. <laughs> well, actually, it was uh, dad's grandpa. He lived. Well, hey. Wahe. Uh, Okamoto. Yes. He lived... In the church. In the church. And so you had a, a, a hide in, hiding spot ready well, to go. Well, we went there and used his phone. And then I informed all my siblings. Yeah. And dad called his family. We went to dad's house. Oh, you went to dad's house. How did they react? When he left... Spokane to come down to pick me up. He told his mother, I'm leaving. Oh, where are you going? I'm going to bring Sue home. And that was enough said. That was all that he said. <laughs> yeah. Uh, two families of very little communication. Yes. So, yeah, there's a whole uh, a rabbit hole we could go down around these phone calls, <laughs> but one of the main uh, stories to tell is that your parents were in Kansas at a wedding. Oh, that's a lovely story. It's kind of a, yeah. something from the movies. <laughs> yeah. So your cousin is getting married in yes. in Kansas and it's uh, the wedding that your parents would have loved where it has all the flowers and the people and the the guest list and it's a white couple and it has all the things and they are uh, at the wedding and, no, no, no. Well, well, they're on the way to the reception. They're, they're, so they're every, on the way to the ceremony. Oh, to the ceremony. Oh, I thought they were on the way to the reception. Okay, so they're uh, driving from uh, wherever they're staying to the ceremony. It's kind of a long highway. Yes. It, think Kansas. Think... Um, flat plains. Flat, one road, no lights, no traffic. Yeah. That's always what's in my head. No, nothing. I mean, just wheat fields or whatever, this grain on either side. And they're just on their way to my cousin's wedding. You had a, a sister-in-law who was more talkative and communicative and vocally outwardly against the fact that her younger sister-in-law had rebelled against the family and married a Japanese-American guy. So she calls... She's trying to get a hold of your parents. Um, she thinks your, they ought to know. Your brother is, in his typical way, staying out of it. Mm -hmm. Vern Jr., very quiet fella. But his wife, not so quiet, is 
uh, going to take action and is trying to track down your parents and of course just calling around and uh, she's informed that they had left. They're on the they're on the road. They're on the that road. That doesn't stop her. She calls the police. Literally calls the police in Kansas, which is not nine one one. It's back then. It would be some. <laughs> lo- she had to probably look up the, f- the, f- the local county sheriff or something. What is that, Smokey and the Bandit, or yeah. some kind of thing? Yeah, <laughs> right. sunglasses. <laughs> yeah, call the police. Uh, Imagine the police, you get this phone call and, and she, she tells them the situation. They have to, you know, you have to inform, not waiting for even the ceremony, because you could certainly call the venue. The police, they take action, which is bizarre. <laughs> Can you imagine calling the police and, and under these circumstances? Did they, did they be like, go inform them that their daughter got married? What's wrong with you? And so the police <laughs> actually. Uh, 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 turn their sirens on mm-hmm. and manage to Lights. find manage to find your parents' car by description. Pull them over. Mm-hmm. Inform them on the side of a highway in Kansas that their princess, blonde, <laughs> white daughter, has eloped and is now married to a disgusting brown person. <laughs> and uh, uh, then I don't. They didn't say it that way. Well, that's said, the implication. Yeah, that's the implication. I guess. I guess that's the implication, <laughs> and so then uh, uh, your parents are reeling, and the word spreads throughout the entire wedding. And your cousin would later tell you that the most exciting part of her own wedding was your wedding because that was all that anyone. Well, could talk it was about. really disappointing because everybody was mingling and everything, but the only conversation on anybody's lips was my wedding. <laughs> Yeah. What I had done and not their wedding. And your parents are furious, I'm guessing. Well, I don't know. Disappointed, surely. Yeah. And what it, What can they do? They're probably wondering what it, how can they reverse it? Yeah, right. Which didn't amount to anything. And then they found out you're pregnant, so then it's even more of a done deal. Then kind of skipping head, ahead through the history for the listeners out there, your parents... Uh, slowly warm up to the idea and slowly warm up to dad. Uh, I know because there's footage, uh, film footage that I have on my computer of by that Christmas. So this would have been June, uh, early June that the wedding happened by Christmas, December, you and dad are over at the house with a young baby, Mark (laughs) and dad's being treated as a family member by that point. Yes, he was very well embraced. Eventually. And when you say slowly, it was slowly in my mind because the days would go slow f- for me. But when you think that we got married in June and then they're here, this was Christmas, that was really brief, yeah. truly. But and- I, I know that from what you told me that there was a, a few weeks or months where there was radio silence from your parents. Right, Where they, right. they just didn't contact you or anything uh, even though they knew you were married and and pregnant Mm -hmm. so but then to me that was also kind of normal i mean it was hands-off parenting yeah yeah and then not only that they eventually accepted and and were cool with dad they eventually really fell in love with dad and us kids the old yes there wasn't any problem once they knew who dad was i mean he well dad is a very, he's a charming guy and, and very non-threatening mm-hmm. and a good listener. Mm-hmm. And so, you know. And there, there wasn't anything to, to dislike about him except for his race, you yeah. know. And they, I have to, I'd like to have had conversations with my parents about race because they weren't like adamant. They were never angry towards blacks or towards Asians. People of color. So their coming around wasn't... I just wished I had given them more credit. I think I, they may have come around. You know, who knows? Because in a matter of six months, they did. Mm-hmm. Just in knowing Alan and knowing he's not a bad guy, mm-hmm. you know, he has something to offer. Mm-hmm. And so... And no joke, he became... Th- the favorite, our family, correct me if I'm wrong. He found out only when we went on our trip to Salina, what, a couple of years ago. In Kansas. My cousin, whose, whose wedding we disrupted, 
he pulled Alan aside and he said, my father told my cousin that Alan was his number one. Yeah. In-law. In-law. Ch- mm-hmm. Child-in-law. Yeah. Uh, there's a clip of your 25th anniversary party where granddad, he says that our family is his favorite. Yes. <laughs> and the grand, his grandkids, me and my siblings, are his favorite. <laughs> She fooled us and ran off and got married when we were down at two other weddings, but uh, it, her, her, her wedding turned out better than any of the rest we've ever been to. It's a wonderful family. We love all of them. They're some of our best thought-of children that we've got. <laughs> and when we would go out to the lake property in Hayden Lake in Idaho, you would get the A-frame beds and your siblings would be stuck in the barn, literally a barn. Or trailer. Or trailer. Anyway, we could get into the weeds on that one for for, yes. for Geraldine's sake, I suppose, cousin Geraldine. But the transition was not only you know relatively fast, but also swung you know pretty far, and to the point where eventually your parents are very much interested in Japan. They are hosting Japanese exchange students, Ikuko, and having the sister city thing. Your dad help build, design the Japanese garden that still Mm -hmm. stands in Spokane? Well, not design. That was beautifully done by a a true Japanese landscape architect. My father's part in the garden was that he did the construction. Mm -hmm. And to the point where most of the Japanese-American accoutrement in my house is from your parents. So it's an interesting journey. And when you talk about how they weren't at least openly racist when you were growing up and that you maybe should have given them more benefit of the doubt. It just makes me wonder, yeah, if we could talk to them back then and and really get down to it, what was the motivation? Is it truly some racist held notions? It would be weird if they didn't have racist notions, by the way. Oh, yes, it would have been weird. So I wonder if your parents, if we could really drill down with them, even in the 60s, when you got married, if they would say things like, well, we just worry, because that was another thing. That it was a have. big worry. What about our children? Yeah, you, Everybody was so worried that our children would be yeah. abused, uh, bullied, um, yeah. any number of bad Right, things. that was always, and it's a racist trope sometimes, an excuse that they'll say that we're trying to protect kids, but it's really just an excuse to be racist. But on the flip side, it it could actually be a legitimate concern given the way that people treated mixed race kids. Um, And maybe it was that. They're just such bad communicators that they didn't sit you down and say something like, look, we love you and we don't want to stand in the way of you choosing who you want to spend the rest of your life with. And certainly we don't think any lesser of him or, or you, but you should be aware of these problems and we're worried or whatever. You know, it's a much mm-hmm. different conversation, but the way they communicate it is through control and abuse and just putting their foot down and not having any conversation. So you just have to wonder what was going on there because the 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 switch for them was so quick and so It was very quick. And so rap and so uh far from what you would imagine because if they were truly si- not just a silent acceptance. Right. A tolerance, they right? Embraced Everything. Right. Embraced our family, embraced the Japanese culture through the sister city exchanges, embraced the Japanese Spokane community, became friends with the leaders within that community. My parents were remarkable through all of that. It makes you wonder, I never thought about it now, but maybe the fact that you were open to dating dad in the first place and didn't have that knee-jerk reaction of, racist concerns maybe that was subtly passed down to you from your parents in a way because it seems like if that is the way they were after you got married there might be attitudes and and perspectives that were present prior because i've always framed it as your parents maybe particularly your dad was just kind of your classic racist who you know the sort of caricature of what i imagine well, you're coming be. from the south and being conservative and that sort of thing but I don't know. It almost makes me wonder what would have happened had I been more open and... and Forced it, maybe. 
f- and forced it, um, but stood my ground earlier. Yeah. Rather than being responsive, I could have been active. Yeah, I mean, you were being abused, but it, yeah, it does. It's asking a lot <laughs> yeah. of you. But uh, yeah, it, it. What would have happened if you would have endured that and just continued to batch so, by the way i'm still with him and that's just the way it's because once you got married the they could have continued to be they, racist and, yes and, and abusive and and cut but us once, off but that that choice that you made in this very outward affirmative way was your line in the sand and in a way you could say they respected that so if you had drawn that line earlier like mm-hmm. shown them the ring of like we're engaged so you just wonder like would they have adjusted earlier yeah mm-hmm. it's kind of interesting again it's a lot to ask of an 18 19 year old young inexperienced yeah <laughs> girl <laughs> who's literally being beaten i'm uh, going from day to day <laughs> yeah but yeah it it is interesting well we only got to three questions mom I know, and I'm, I'm really anxious to talk more. Well, let, let's uh, adjourn here, and um, <laughs> let's record another time, and maybe we can get through the questions. Because I feel like could... that, a lot of the questions had to do with this, by the way. Oh. So we actually hit on probably a, a set of 15 questions mm. within that conversation. But I know that a lot of the questions were indicating that a lot of listeners were curious about that story. Mm. And... I knew a lot of what we talked about, but I, I, there were a lot of new things in there. And I think, you know, it's quite a dramatic story. And so in conclusion, what I'll say, Mom, is that it's, I'm sure the listeners are agreeing with this, that it is extremely commendable, you know, a very, and I'll tear up thinking about it, the strength of character that you had and have. You know, you fall in love with who you fall in love with. And to just know, you know, without any kind of hesitation and to stand by your man, as they say. Mm-hmm. Right? The thing that I, I, I'll ask dad about this at times, like, did dad, you know, I'll ask dad, how did mom deal with the racism? Like, what what were you seeing? And dad will say, like, well, she just knew that the racism was wrong. She just knew that. And how, you know, because it wasn't like you had some social justice course or any kind of support around that. It wasn't a topic of conversation well, it, among white people. There were no conversations, no internet, no magazines, whatever. You know, I mean, you get... Not even a movement yeah. in the news, right? It wasn't until mm-hmm. uh, later in the 60s, mm-hmm. civil rights, right? And that this girl from suburban Spokane mm-hmm. would just know, even though she was rich and privileged and in all the ways, really, you know, you literally had a debutante ball, right? What, yes, so, the, what, what they called the white cotillion. White cotillion, which is for the Masons, right? Yes, I believe so. Like the, uh, but and, or the city fathers. Yeah, and I'll show. Uh, maybe I'll post a picture of this somewhere. But you are the pinnacle of white privilege in this photograph. I mean, you have this dress, and you have your. I apologize for it, all Well, how are you supposed to know? You're 15, <laughs> and you have your attendants, right? You have your friends that are with you in, in lesser positions, and, and you have, I think, literally a scepter and a crown, and you're paraded around, and you're, you look like a Marilyn Monroe, and <laughs> your hair is all done up, and, and you come from that, and you know that the racism is wrong. It's just incredible. Yeah. Well, I, w- I have to say, I did have a very, very privileged life. I didn't feel it at the time. I didn't know I was privileged. But when it became apparent, I ha- started getting a feeling of it at high school level, and it became really uncomfortable. It was a, it was a place that didn't fit who I was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just so weird that you would have that. And, and I don't know. I was that bouncy little blonde, curly-haired girl. Tomboy. Playing in the dirt. Yeah. That's who I am. Well, it also <laughs> just, it does make me wonder about what subtle messages your parents might have actually given you that we might not give them credit for, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, some kids do emerge out of difficulty and out of where there's literally no influence that is influencing them to find the strength. They do find the strength. That does happen. But it just makes me wonder if your dad's 
modest upbringing, and your mom's too, but particularly your dad's, was subtly talked about or indicated or, uh, or something. I don't know. But at the very at least, it's very strange that to me, and I think to the listeners, that without any influence from the outside, any direct influence for sure, without any conversation in society, just imagine that. Like racism is just a given. You don't need to even talk about racism because everyone understands. They're, the Jim Crow South is still around. There are laws in the books in states that white people can't intermingle with other literal laws passed by legislatures, meaning prison time or citations if you're caught. It's like something from, I don't know, just an, another time. And it, it's just the norm. And for you to just make a choice of... No, you know, that doesn't make any sense. Alan is the love of my life, and that's just the way it's going to be. And everyone else can go to hell. And and to have your family and your parents and your and dad's family, to some extent, <laughs> community as well, everyone, no one's supporting it. I mean, that mm. that's always the we thing. no support. That's always the thing of, uh, it's a big part, especially when you're that age, of everyone's supportive. Everyone's like, yay, the cute mm. couple is here. Oh, two lovebirds. <laughs> it, 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 that cocooning around you of a community and acceptance and a venue, you know, and that you'd have to work against so much odds. There were so many points where it'd be just so easy just to, you know, maybe you wait a little longer uh, sending a letter back and you think, God, is this all worth it? It's just a pain in the ass. You know, there, there are a lot of boys in the fraternity next door that I wouldn't have to hide about <laughs> and, and I'd be able to see more often. There, you know, there's so many different temptations and to just know and to be here 60 years later, right? Yeah, <laughs> 60 years. Yeah. <laughs> well, do you absorb that, Mom? Know what I'm saying? When I hear it from your mouth, <laughs> I, I, I just did what I did. And it was, wasn't easy, but... It just had to be done. I mean, it just... Was it love? Yes. Was that what you would say? Yeah. Love. That's yeah. what... There And connection. I mean, there was, you know, I mean, you can love, you can love sexually or through the mind or whatever, but no, you, there's a connection. This person and I need to be together. You just knew. Just knew. We both knew. <laughs> and really... um you know, they talk about being colorblind or something, and I guess I was. I mean, it just... Regarding race. Yeah, with regard to race. It just it was an odd issue. Mm -hmm. Just... See the human. Yeah, it's human. We're talking people here. Mm -hmm. We're talking eyes, nose, ears. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, uh, uh, there were trials and tribulations as a mixed race kid myself but i think it's more of a pro than a con because mm -hmm. to summarize an entire lifetime particularly as, as, as a child I, i'll say that it wasn't that much of an issue but it was at times and uh, and it hurt and i was bullied and i was called names but i think i had a strong family that was there for me and friends and community, you know, we lived in the same community throughout my entire childhood, pretty much. And so everyone, you know, I had social capital, as they say, <laughs> I, I had friends, I had people that knew me, I had people that I could depend on. And when, you know, when the racism things would happen, it would often be a new kid in school, someone that didn't know me in my community and thought that was okay to do to me. And uh, so it was more of a, of an anomaly. The other benefit was that I was a giant as a child, <laughs> so people didn't usually mess with me just on that fact, and when they did, I would usually manhandle them, so I benefited that way. But I think the other pro is that it taught me from a young age about culture, not just race and ethnicity, but that I think I slowly was learning, oh, there's this notion in society that there are beliefs that people have about people based on their race or their skin and color or something. And they're wrong. <laughs> what else is wrong in society? What else should I be questioning? What, sh what am I wrong about? I, I remember having those subtle thoughts that really 
planted seeds that grew into things once I was a teenager and, and really philosophizing a lot by that point. And that's a huge gift, you know, to, to be given that early experience that to question things and not to take things for, for granted and not th- take things as gospel. Just because society or the pulpit or your friends or the television are telling you things, it's not necessarily true and it could be dangerous. Because I've seen, I've been at the wrong end of the stick regarding the dangerous notions that, that other people have been brainwashed around. But yeah, so thanks for coming on the podcast, Mom. We'll have to have you back again and get to the other 97 questions. Well, I do know there's a great interest about you and your young life. Yeah. So we'll have to get into that next time. Mm-hmm. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because... You deserve it. <laughs>